Good morning, church family. It is a beautiful day out there, isn't it? My name is Shalina, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the privilege this morning of calling us into this place, calling us into worship this morning. We are coming um, from actually worshiping throughout our weeks in the ways that you have um, express love to the people in your lives, the ways in which you have found joy in creation. You have been a part of worship all along, but there's something special that happens when we all come from our different places and we worship together. We worship in spirit and in truth. We come together and we share songs with one another. We share reading together. And God um, tells us in his word that where his people gather, the spirit rests there. And the spirit is everywhere, but the spirit rests in a special way when we come together and when we worship. So we're excited about what God wants to do this morning in our midst. We are at our third Sunday of Advent. Today we're going to be moving from a place of misery to a place of joy as we light our joy candle. Last week, um, Matt brought us through the story of Abraham and brought us from a place of fear to a place of love. And today we're tackling the story of Isaac. One of the things that we see in all of these stories is that love doesn't just come. Joy doesn't just come. Hope doesn't just come. There's a wrestle involved. There's a story involved, and we all know this in our lives. And every, every one of us has gone through places of struggle and of wrestling and have wondered, where are you, God? The Psalms are a great place for us to go when we feel that way, when we're like, oh, okay, we're singing about joy, but I don't feel joyful. We go to the Psalms, and David was excellent at the wrestle. He was excellent at letting it all out before God with honest transparency and then saying, but yet I will praise you. So this morning, uh, for our call to worship, I'm going to read Psalm 40. And if you've been following along, we have some Advent reflections that are in our blog um, that happen here on a Sunday morning, and there's a little bit more for you to dig into. But we end each one with an adoration of a psalm. And so for this week, it'll be Psalm 40. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to pray together, and we're going to worship. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done for us the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. Here we are. We have come. We desire to do your will, God. Your law is within our hearts. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray together. So God, just like, just like David, we stand in the middle of this place of wanting more for you, crying out for you to save us. 
and then being overwhelmed by the things in our lives that seem to um, want to close in and to bring us down. But this morning, God, we desire your joy. And so in faith and trust, we're going to sing of your joy. We're going to worship. We're not going to withhold our praise from the assembly. We're going to share our songs of joy with one another. By your spirit, would you take that and would you plant seeds of joy in each one of us? For those who come here in sadness, would they be uplifted by your spirit and by our proclamations of your greatness? Meet us here, Spirit of God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus. 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see so clear. Jesus, we've just sung of what you've done for us. We know that everything is through you. It's from you. We worship you, but also our worship is because of you. We're able to enter into the presence of God because of you. It's all through Christ. So we say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. If we're still living in that place of burden and shame, would you by your spirit come and draw us to that place of salvation, to that place of joy, of security, of knowing your great love for us? What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. 
He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. <laughs> you can be seated. We're going to pray together our giving liturgy as an act of worship and as an act of defiance against the ways of greed and scarcity in our world. The giving liturgy is something we do every week to remind ourselves that God's kingdom is a generous kingdom, that God's kingdom is one of abundance. And part of the reason we do this is, is in lieu of passing the plate, but also it's because we want to remind ourselves of 
the reality that it's by our collective generosity that we do things that we do here and also that it's really easy to get stuck into a mindset of scarcity. These are hard days and weird days as a culture. And yet, Jesus' kingdom comes in the midst with just the most ridiculous and abundant ways, and we want to align towards that instead of the ways of the world. And so if you're wondering about ways to give, you can scan the QR code in front of you, or uh, go to the website or check the info kiosk. But let's, uh, let's pray this together and remind ourselves of God's kingdom. So I'll read the little part. You can read the bold part. Father in heaven, you are generous. There's nothing we have that you have not given us. Our world is corrupted by greed and scarcity, by grasping for more and fearing there won't be enough. Jesus, your kingdom is not this way. Instead, it's built on abundance. Spirit, you freely give of your gifts. Empower us to do the same. So we're going to go into our Advent feature this morning. And Advent is the season of preparation for Christmas. Just like Lent is a season of waiting and getting ready for Easter, Advent is this way, a season of getting ready for Christ, for Christ to come and presence himself with us again. And we, we go back to the prophets, and we remember the story of Israel in their waiting for the Messiah as we too wait for Jesus to come back again. But their story and our story is similar, that we are waiting. That Christmas isn't just about Christ's incarnation. It's also about looking forward to his coming back to dwell with us again. And so this is a, a time where we, we both prepare for Jesus and also look forward to Jesus. And so this morning we're going to be lighting the joy candle. But before we do, let's listen to the words of the prophet Zephaniah. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice, you, or he will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. And at that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth. I will restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Israel had found themselves in exile, taken far away from the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land was to be their everlasting possession, but they had squandered it. They were to live in the land as an alternate humanity, living as a blessing to the nations. Instead, they lived in such a way that they brought a curse on the land and those on it. They had been unfaithful to God, had enslaved others, and not given the land a rest. So God removed them from it. No longer in the promised land, now in Babylon. No longer in promise, but in darkness and confusion. And as they sat in their exile in another land, we read of their misery in Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us to sing songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Don't let your hands hang limp, is Zephaniah's word to them. The people's misery was so great that they couldn't even bring themselves to reach for joy, to remember better days, to hope. They could only bring themselves to sit and weep, weep for all that was lost, weep for the space they find themselves in. In their misery of exile, wondering if they'll return, unable to sing, God breaks through with promise. 
He says, I will gather you. I will bring you home. I'm mighty to save and I will save you. I'll reverse your fortunes. I will bring blessing to your cursing. I punish you through correction, but that will end. It may feel like my posture towards you is anger, but know that my delight is in you. You may not be able to sing, but I can sing, and I'm singing songs of joy over you. In their misery, God delivers good news that will lead to joy and gladness, that one day the Mighty One will come and save them. And years later, back in the land, some shepherds are watching their sheep at night. An angelic messenger appears to them. And his message? Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in a town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Good news that will cause great joy. This morning we light the joy candle to remind ourselves that Jesus' birth was good news. That Jesus' birth brought good news. So let's light the candle. Jesus has done the rescuing. Jesus has restored his people to their creator. He's made all the sad things come untrue. And this morning, we remember that his kingdom is a kingdom of joy. And that means Jesus is the king of joy. The laughter that was promised to Abraham and Sarah is the laughter that he wants to bring to all people. And so this Advent morning, will you receive this joy and allow it to be your strength? of longing. What do our longings look like as we say we long for joy and peace and love, hope. So if you've been with us and you know it, I invite you to sing along um, or to just listen.
darkness of winter unsettles us. Night stretches on and we are stuck in a slow passage of time. Bright, cheerful lights distract us for a moment. But gifts and food and even laughter do not ease the ache that has been exposed in our waiting. In the stillness and quiet, we are confronted with our longings. We are people searching for hope, love, joy, and peace. But the night feels like it may never pass until we catch a glimpse. It is not even the sun itself that we see, but the glow of first light that lets us know that the night is ending. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you this morning. For those joining us online, a special welcome to you from wherever you happen to be joining us from in the world today. We're glad you're here through the ways of technology. Before we look into God's Word this morning, we're going to be looking into Genesis 22. So if you have your Bible, uh, you can turn to that story in, as part of our Advent journey that we start in Genesis uh, this year, which has been a, it's been a real treat for us. I hope you've been enjoying it as well. But Genesis 22 is the text we'll be in. Uh, if you've been part of Stony Plain Alliance for a while, you'll know that every weekend there's tables set there with the communion elements, and we do that every single weekend as our practice of coming to the table of mercy. Well, this weekend we're not actually going to be able to celebrate at the table because of logistical delivery problems, which means that um, I encourage you to go home and have communion with your families, with friends, whatever else, invite your neighbors over, have some bread and juice, whatever else and extend God's mercy to one another. Uh, so just for this weekend, uh, we're not going to be doing that as part of the service, uh, but still means so much to us as a faith community, and we'll pick that up next weekend. Lord willing, the delivery comes. And uh, don't let that be like a bad omen for your Christmas gifts that are coming by Amazon that said it'll definitely be here by December 21st or whatever. Uh, just a little glitch there. Hope you'll understand with us. Our series that we've been in, over Advent uh, is called Longing for Light. And as we as a team were talking a number of months ago about how we wanted to tell the Jesus story again, uh, coming up to our Christmas Eve celebrations, we sense God put on our hearts the stories of Genesis because there's that idea that the story of Jesus doesn't just really begin in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or wherever else. We, we have the birth narratives. That the story of Jesus begins right back at the beginning of the story right in the heart of creation, right in God's redemptive work of repairing what was broken through sin. And so we arrive at this season of Advent through a long, winding, and often difficult road. When we see in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. And on it goes into that genealogy. What Matthew's doing here, and Matt actually talked about our Matt, not the biblical Matthew. Our Matt last weekend talked about how this sets up the idea that this story is coming from somewhere. That Jesus doesn't just drop into history at some, uh, at some point out of nowhere, but there's this story of this unfolding way of God's grace and mercy being told through the characters of the scriptures. And as I said last weekend, Matt taught a message about this man named Abraham, who's mentioned here in Matthew chapter 1. And how this man, Abraham, was called by God to leave his home and become the person through who God's rescue mission to the human race would be initiated. And that God was going to give Abraham and his wife, Sarah, a son, even though they were really quite old, well advanced in years. I love how the scriptures say that Abraham was old, Sarah was well advanced in years. I know, like, I love the biblical writers, they know how to work it. And it would be through this son, it says in the scriptures, that through Abraham and Sarah's son, and that offspring, that that was going to be the, the way in which God was going to bless all the families of the earth. And we were, we were reminded in Genesis that when God created, it was a good world and there was goodness in people. But sin and deception ended up hijacking the story, but God wasn't done. 
And he comes to this man named Abraham, and God says, my heart's intention towards people is to bless and to love and to show mercy. And so through you, through like a representative being you, and through the children you're going to have, eventually every family on earth will will be blessed through you. And that all seems well and good until we see something happen in Genesis 22. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament says in chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac, that's Abraham and Sarah's son, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. There are these moments in the biblical story that cause us to pause, to be jarred to a halt even, because we're not sure what God is up to. You see, this story in Genesis 22 that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, and we pause and say, Abraham's going to sacrifice Isaac? What's that all about? Well, this is a story about walking in the darkness, in the space between misery and joy. And some of us who are here and some who are joining us online, and most of us at some point or another in our lives understand what it is like to walk in darkness, to wake up under the weight of misery every single day. And some of you are walking in that right now. And there's something that we need to know about faith as we get into really the details of what it means to follow Jesus in these seasons. That sometimes faith means that you just keep walking in darkness and you just refuse to quit. Oftentimes faith means you just hang on. Faith is about hanging on in dark places because it is faith that keeps misery from paralyzing us in our longing to experience joy. Joy, as the Bible describes it, is that sense of having it all provided. That your basic needs and what you need the most, what you're longing for the most, has been provided and you are satisfied. That's what joy means. Not just external happiness. Joy means I have a sense of contentment about it all being provided for me. And yet so many of us live in an experience of misery that says we are always short, there's never enough, and I'm really disappointed. So what do you do when you have to walk in the darkness of misery and God seems distant or remote or or silent or even working against the plans he's been unfolding in your life? One Old Testament scholar says that Abraham in this moment when he's being called by God to sacrifice is stepping into what he calls the road of God forsakenness. When it seems like God is contradicting himself. When it seems like God wants to stop the salvation that he has begun. And one thing to understand as we step into the darkness with Abraham here this morning, that faith is not about doubt-free certainty. Faith is about tenacious obedience and clinging to God's true character as he reveals that to us. So this now, friends, is the pivotal moment of Abraham and Isaac's life, found in Genesis 22, that this writer of Hebrews we read about is referring to. And it says this, sometime later, God tested Abraham. The first thing the writer does is the writer assures us that Isaac, Abraham's son, is never in any real danger here. You notice that? We have a perspective on this story that Abraham does not have. We know something that he doesn't know. It's a test. And the word for the test becomes a really important word in the Old Testament. It's a tricky word for us because we don't like it. We don't like that God would test people. But it's used often in the Old Testament story, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, about God testing his people. And it's only ever used for the people of God. It's reserved for people of faith. It is understood from the Hebrew scriptures that the testing, it's understood as an act of love. And we kind of do this sometimes, don't we? I mean, parents test our children to see how they're growing. Athletes long to test themselves against great competition. When someone falls in love or makes a friend, you've got to test the feelings, the devotion, the affection of another person. You find out what's inside of them, not as a way of manipulation. It's part of walking deeply with people in the exposing and the revealing of our hearts. And so this now is the supreme test of the Old Testament, and it's really hard. God says, Abraham. And Abraham says right there in verse 1, here I am. Now we understand 
Abraham at this point is not just giving information about his geographical location, right? Like he's offering himself to God. This is his way. This is kind of a polite way of saying, I'm at your service. Here am I. Here I am. Because Abraham has heard this voice before. And this voice has made wonderful promises to him about his destiny, and it's asked him to do really hard things. This voice told him to leave his home and everything familiar, and Abraham did it. This voice told him that he and God were in covenant together. That they were going to be kind of partners, and there was going to be a sign of that covenant, and the sign was going to be circumcision. And Abraham was going to have to circumcise himself, and he wondered why the sign couldn't be like a secret handshake or like a decoder ring or something else like that, but it wasn't, and he circumcised himself. And this same voice told him that he and his wife would have a son, although they had a combined age of 190 years old. And Abraham laughed, and Sarah laughed, but apparently he responded in obedience once again because, in fact, Sarah did get pregnant, and they did have a son. And now the voice comes to him once more, and for as far as we know in the scriptures, it's the last time this voice is heard in Abraham's life. And this time he's asked one final thing. You see, up to this point, he's been asked to surrender everything in his life, his home, his family, everything, for the sake of a promise. For the sake of this wonderful promise that through him, God was going to redeem everything in the world and restore things to goodness. And now the voice is going to ask him to give up one more thing. Give up the promise. His response is kind of an offering of himself, saying, I will not run or evade or hide. I am wholly available. I am at your service. Here am I. Here I am. And I believe the writer has this in here to help us understand how people of faith respond to the call of God. Here I am, God. No reservations, nothing held back. Here I am. And God doesn't just say to him, take Isaac, does he? God phrases this in a way that makes it clear. He understands what he's asking of Abraham. And this story is crafted with great skill. It says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Take your son, Isaac. So interesting, this call to sacrifice actually wouldn't have felt that strange to Abraham. Child sacrifice in this time, the gods and the deities that people worshipped, the gods, whatever else, were constantly asking people to go sacrifice their children. And so it stands out as a stark thing to us, but really within Abraham's culture, this thing was happening. But it was still confusing because this voice who had first called him didn't seem like the kind of voice that was like the other gods. And now he says, take your son Isaac. God even calls Abraham's son by name. He says Isaac, and Isaac means laughter. That's what his name means. Abundant joy. It means laughter. And why was Isaac named that? Because Abraham and Sarah laughed when God first told them that they were going to have a child. First, because they couldn't believe it. The, you know, the sheer impossibility of what God had promised. And then they laughed because they did believe it because it actually happened. And then they just laugh at the absurdity of it all. Abraham and Sarah both laugh when God tells them tells it to them that this is the promise, and God says, oh, and by the way, why don't you go ahead and name your kid laughter? And so they do, and Abraham and Sarah and God are given this great laugh, wonderful laugh together. But Abraham's not laughing anymore. It's like the joy is being sucked out of this story moment by moment. The laughter was going out of his life, draining from him, and perhaps Isaac at this point is even feeling the dark irony of his name. Because now the writer begins to chronicle just exactly what Abraham does in response to the call. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. The writer gives so many details here. He doesn't say anything much about what's, what's happening inside Abraham's heart or mind. And we'll see why as we go along. The writer just focuses on what Abraham does. And what Abraham does is just what God asks him to do. In, in verse 4, Abraham has begun this trip with his son and two servants. And it says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Side note, 
Whenever you see third day in the Bible, just pay attention to that. It means lots. In other words, this trip goes on for three days. It's not just a momentary deal. And we want to cry out. Like, I mean, if you read the story, whether this is the first time you've heard it, or the hundredth time you've heard it, or a thousandth time, if you're like me, you want to cry out to Abraham and say, Abraham, it's all right. It's okay. It's going to turn out fine. He's not that kind of God. You were believing the right voice. And God will provide. But life doesn't work that way. Because you only go one chapter in line at a time. You can only start at the beginning and go through the middle. And when you're in the middle, no one's allowed to skip forward to the end. No one is allowed to see how it's really going to work out, if at all. You only go by faith in the journey between misery and joy. Now before we go on with the story of Abraham, I want to say a word about what faith is because so often we can misunderstand it and it has been misused in people's lives badly. Because very often people beat themselves up because they think that, well, my faith isn't good enough or I need to have more faith or they need to believe in God with more certainty and they need to have no doubts at all in their journey with God. And it's so important for us to understand that when the Bible talks about faith, the faith that characterizes Abraham, the faith that sustains us in the days of misery, it is not talking about a faith that is doubt-free certainty. Abraham's story reflects doubt all over the place. I mean, he lies when he goes down to Egypt and says that his wife's really his sister because he doubts God's ability to really protect him and look after him. Abraham impregnates his wife's servant Hagar because he doubts God's ability to really give him a child through his wife Sarah. He laughs when God gives him the promise because he doubts that he and Sarah are going to have a child in their old age. He has these evidences of doubt all the way through the story, and yet he is held up through the scripture as the model of faith because at certain points he just keeps obeying God and he just keeps staying on the road. He just hangs on. And I know it's probably not the best definition for you, but for this morning, faith in the scriptural sense means hanging on and believing that the God in which you have put your faith will prove himself faithful. Now Abraham turns to his servant in verse 5 and he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship. And then this very interesting statement, and then we will come back to you. Why does he say we will come back to you? Because it's really clear in the text. Does he want to mislead these people he's with? Does he want to hide what he's really up to? Or does he think in his mind that he really won't go through with it? That at the last minute it will be too awful that he will hold back and not plunge the knife into his son? Or does he think that somehow in spite of it all, God will keep his promise that somehow it is, it is true that through Isaac, through this boy, all the nations on earth will be blessed. All the families will be blessed. But we don't know. The writer doesn't say, you know, the writer doesn't tell us what's going on in Abraham's heart and mind. Maybe it's a little bit of all of it. You know, the writer of Hebrews, again, reflecting on this, tells us that Abraham was probably reasoning that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. It's the only way through this. But here's what the writer focuses on. Abraham stays on the road. He just keeps obeying God. Because faith does not mean that you never have doubts or questions or confusion. It means that you hang on. It is tenacious obedience in the days of misery. Verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So interesting here, isn't it? The writer tells us who carried what. Notice Abraham takes the dangerous objects for himself. The objects that a young boy could hurt himself with. Abraham carries the knife in the fire because it's a dad's job to protect their kid. He places the burden of, on his son's back so that his son must carry the wood on which he will be killed up the mountain. And now it's just the two of them. And the two of them walk together, it says. The implication is that they're walking in silence. And Isaac turns to his father, and Isaac now is old enough to understand that something is not quite right here. And he says, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I've seen the sacrifices before, and we're missing, Dad, we're missing a really important element in our sacrifice here. Oh, 
oh, now it's getting really dark on the road to the top of Moriah. And by this time, Abraham must have wanted to run or hide, and Isaac asks him, well, what about the sacrifice? I know how this works. There's no animal. And his father is strangely silent on it. His father gives him another kind of ambiguous answer. Maybe it's doubtful, maybe it's fearful, maybe it's hopeful, maybe it's all of it. And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. They are together, but they are separated by this enormous barrier. This burden that Abraham bears, and then they come to the place, and the writer just keeps telling us bit by bit by bit of Abraham's obedience, his step-by-step obedience. He builds an altar. He takes the wood off Isaac's back, and he lays it on the altar, and now is the time, and there's no more evading it. And so he takes Isaac to him. And this is the promise of God's redemption. This is his future and his destiny. This is his hope. This is the covenant of God, but he's not just that. This is his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loves. He ties up his legs and he binds his arms together so that there will be no struggle at the end. And now we're starting to struggle, aren't we? We don't like it when this happens. But it's here. And Abraham picks up his son, his one and only son, and he holds the same body that he held on the first day that Isaac was born. He holds the same little body that he used to hold and to feed and to bathe and to rock to sleep. He holds a little body that used to, he used to check on at night to make sure he was just still breathing. Parents, right? You know what that's like. The little body that he would hold sometimes and just shake with laughter at the unbelievable impossibility of all of it. And now he holds that little body for one final time and he places Isaac on the altar. It says he lays him on the wood. He takes the knife and he reaches his hand toward heaven and with his hand, make a single move to end the life that he was part of creating and with it destroy all of his hope and all of his joy and all of his laughter. And he raises the knife in the air and here we have to linger for just one moment. You see, we want to hurry and get past this point, don't we? It's like, la, 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 we got to get through this. We want to get to where it resolves. But as I was praying for us uh, this week in preparing this message, I felt like Jesus asked me to linger here with you at this point in the story, at the moments of misery. We need to linger here for a little while because the truth is that you and I, we're like Abraham. We have not yet reached the end of our story either, and we need to be honest about what it's like in the land of Moriah. Because it's like this, and you know this. Moriah is a place where people have these desperate longings and hopes for things. Some of you are here, and you had wonderful dreams when you got married. But you're in a marriage that has been an absolute deep disappointment to you. And you've prayed about it, and you've wept about it, and you've sought counseling for it, and you've tried everything you know how to, how to to try and make it through. And for you today, you're wondering if you're just destined to misery. And maybe faith today looks like for you just to hang on. Some of you are single, and you're lonely, and you wonder, why is the gift of companionship and marriage not given to me? And you have this ache inside of you when you see couples together. And while others maybe seem so content in their singleness, you're not. And sometimes faith is just hanging on and refusing to enter into a toxic relationship as a shortcut around the loneliness. And faith looks like hanging on today. Some of us are parents, and while there are so many joys in parenting for some of the journey of raising kids has been about deep pain and immense heartache. And sometimes faith looks like persevering in love when it would be so much easier just to turn cold and forget you have a child at all. Some of you have been called to a vocation or a job or a place of ministry, and you know it was Jesus that invited you to it, but you're in a season where nothing seems to be working out. There's no fruit, despite all of your effort and hard work, and you know that God has not yet released you to something else, and it feels so dark. Well, sometimes faith means you hang on, and you be able tenaciously obedient to God even though it's difficult. It's what it means to be faithful in the land of Moriah where the light doesn't seem to be dawning. 
The land of Moriah may be a deep relationship in which you felt betrayed. It can be a medical diagnosis that has turned your world upside down. It may be a task that's been given to you in which there is no glory and no visible reward attached. It may be a call to keep fighting against the same temptation, that same addiction, over and over and over again, as you have before, and you long just to be done with it, but it doesn't seem to be releasing its grip. And today you sit in a place of temptation where the shortcut seems so easy just to get out of it and just give yourself to that temptation, just give yourself to that addiction again. But maybe faith is saying today in the land of misery, in the place of Moriah, when you're on the mountaintop and it feels like there's no way through, by faith will you just hang on and tenaciously obey Jesus? Trusting in his character that how the story began isn't necessarily how it's going to end. I think of the temptations and things and the pressures. Maybe you're a student, young person, high school, junior high, university, and the pressures you're under you just so badly want to be accepted by a friend group. And there's all sorts of things coming at you to compromise on what you believe and the values you hold. And you're stuck today and you feel like you're in darkness heading into another day of school tomorrow. And yet you feel God asking you to hang on and see it through. And you don't know how. Faith means today you hang on and you decide again to do it God's way. The land of Moriah may be the call to be faithful to a promise, to a life of sacrifice, to pouring yourself out for people that don't seem to care. It can mean the loss of a loved one. Some of you have lost loved ones in this past little while. And this, this, this season has this way, doesn't it? We heard this one speaker when, as a staff, we were studying how the heart shrinks time. And maybe a trauma or a wound that was a long time ago at various seasons, especially around Christmas, it's like the heart shrinks time and you feel the wound all over again. You feel the pain of loss. And you're not sure how you're going to get through. Or today you're in the darkness over the spiritual condition of someone you've never stopped praying for. Friends, I don't know what it looks like for you. I'm still new around here. I'm still getting to know your stories. But I know this. Every human being that ever lived walks in the darkness sometimes, and every single one of us will, at one point or another, find ourselves in deep misery where joy seems absolutely and particularly elusive. And so here we are. And now Abraham raises his hand high in the air to destroy everything. But even at this moment, even at this moment, Abraham somehow believes, not perfectly, he never had in his whole life believed perfectly. He lied and feared and doubted all the way through it. But the reason he doesn't run, the reason he doesn't hide now, the reason he keeps taking step after horrible step is his hope against hope that somehow this strange and sometimes seemingly distant God would yet turn out to be the God who spoke to him so many years ago. And that somewhere in this story of bloodshed and death, would emerge the God who makes impossible promises and then keeps them and then names them laughter. Abraham keeps hoping even when from a human perspective it all seems absurd. He doesn't have perfect faith, he just hangs on in between misery and joy, in between what you're losing and the provision yet to come. He just places himself in the hands of God. Now verse 11. Abraham is again, again is called. His hand is in the air. And this time the writer says, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God, you should know by now, please, here I am. Like I just abandoned myself to your hands. No reservations, there is nothing held back. God, surely you know by now, here I am. God knows. And God says, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld, withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, Mount Moriah, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Moriah ends up getting a new name later. It's called Mount Zion. It's where the temple is built. And on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This, this morning, is the story of Abraham and the story of every human being who's ever walked in the land of Moriah in that valley of the shadow of death. 
And it's your story and it's my story. Because if you're here, you have no one, and maybe you know right now what it's like to walk in darkness. And so as we come to a conclusion here, um, worship team, hold on just a minute. Don't come just yet. Practically, what do we do when we're walking in the darkness? As followers of Jesus, what's our call? I want to give you a few things to think about, really practically, that we're going to pray into here together. What's our call? First of all, we name the darkness. Name the darkness. We don't do lament well as Christians in churches often. We more image manage around pain and make sure that whatever we're posting or however we're showing up to things is smile on, everyone together, walk in, all those sorts of things. We don't lament well. One of the things we're learning as a church in this season is how to lament well. It, naming the darkness is another word, has another word. It's called confess. And confess just means to tell the truth about yourself and the situation. Sometimes when we're standing on the mountain of Moriah, when we're in that dark place, God's not asking us to stuff it down and deal with it later. He's calling us to confess how it feels. And maybe for some of you this week, that's the place you need to be. You just have to say to God, complain up. God, I am not okay with this situation, and I really want it to be different. Here's the second thing we do. Not only do we name the darkness, now we wait for the dawn and waiting on the Lord. That's the hard part. And waiting for the dawn means this. It means we resist shortcuts around the pain and wait on God's provision. There is this thing in us that is all about pain avoidance. I get it. And so often the temptations when they're in the dark place is to take a shortcut out of the loneliness. It's to take a shortcut out of the, out of the sense of longing. It's to take a shortcut out of the place of darkness that I find myself in. Waiting for the dawn as the people of God and what we do in community when we've confessed how dark it is, we're making the confession as well that I will not make my own plan forward. If I must sit in misery and wait for God's provision. I know that the joy of the Lord will be my strength and will count on it. Encouragement to you today, friends. Some of you are right in the heat of a moment where you're thinking about a shortcut out of the pain you're in and you know it would be destructive and you know it's not what God has for you. But you're in it, like you're in the teeth of it right now. And I'm telling you, friends, wait on the provision of God. Let's pray it through together. Let's pray it through together. Here's the third thing. You turn to the light. This is those small steps of obedience. You know, sometimes we think about faith in the grand scheme of all the things that, these great things we're going to do for God. And lots of us have been told throughout our lives, I just believe you're going to do great things for God. And no one ever knows what that means, but we're told that. And it can kind of get into our heads sometimes. But you know what faith often is? The walk with Jesus? You know what it means to be his apprentice? It often means the small steps of obedience. Sometimes the biggest step of faith you ever take is just getting up in the morning. You put your feet on the floor and you go again. And I want to tell you, friends, that counts. In God's kingdom, when everything is telling you just to hide and run away and divert, and yet you get up again and you put your feet on the floor, and the only prayer you can utter is, God, help me. God says, it counts. And we say, God, what do you want me to do? In those small steps of obedience, it leads us to that last thing, that as truth comes, we acknowledge what is revealed. And that's what adoration is. One of the reasons we worship together as a community is because worship is a reorienting force in our lives. When we sing things and say things together, it's how we live like God is good. And we do that for one another. And the reason we do this is because the story of Abraham and Isaac does not end on the summit of Mount Moriah. The story is inviting us to look forward from the story of Abraham, isn't it? Because this story is not an account of divine cruelty or parental neglect. It's a prophetic word that finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Matt read it earlier when the angel comes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the story of Abraham and says, I come to bring you good news of great joy. Do not be afraid because today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. This one's the Messiah, the Lord. He's saying, the angel's proclamation is, the night is coming to an end. Laughter is returning to God's people because provision is coming. And it's in a person, and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. And this Jesus born in Bethlehem, born into the darkness and misery of our broken world, was the source of great joy that we lean into now. You see, Jesus is the one that went to the cross. 
He carried the wood of the sacrifice and then took our place to free us from the sin and the death that was seeking to destroy us. Because the scripture says, for the joy that was set before him, for the opportunity of joy, of absolute provision, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. And that is the one on whom our faith is founded. The one who has said to you, because he has gone to the cross, God's not calling for sacrifice anymore. There was one sacrifice, one final sacrifice, and that was Jesus Christ, and that solved it for all time and for all people. So our joy today, the faith we need to persevere in the darkness is found right here in the presence of Jesus Christ, and that's the good news of the great joy. That whatever your land of Moriah is right now, your biggest fears and troubles and enemies, sin and death, have already been overcome in Christ which means whatever other thing we're facing, it pales in comparison to what Christ has overcome. And what we can worship into today is the reality of the joy of Christ, regardless of external circumstances, because we will lean into the promise that in Jesus Christ, on the mountain where he died, it was provided and provided for all. Why don't we pray? Worship team, won't you come? Father, we come before you today. And we need to confess what it's like to live in the land of Moriah. And for some here today, when we're going to sing joy to the world in a minute, God, thanks that you don't expect us to just kind of conjure up some feeling about what that means. But we are going to choose to sing that even in the places of darkness because you have come. You are giving us a new lens. You're giving us a new vision out of our misery into the place of joy. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, I bless you today with the provision of God's joy. That you would have a deep knowing in in the depths of your soul what it is to be provided for. To have those deepest needs met in the person of Jesus Christ. And before we sing, I want to give you this opportunity. When we gather here on these weekends like this, My prayer is that it wouldn't be just come in and receive and go. If you need ministry this morning, if there's more that you want to work through with God, we have a prayer team at the back corner, my left, your right. You can come see me after, grab one of the pastors. Why don't we, in our response today, because we don't have the table, we just make the time together today to pray this stuff through, to confess what the darkness feels like, to ask Jesus for the joy of the Lord to be our strength to acknowledge what it's like in the land of Moriah, but to do it together. Friends, there's no rush today. If you're needing further ministry, and I pray this just becomes part of our culture here, that we just confess, we just say what's true to one another. And in the way of the Spirit, enliven us today with the truth of God's mercy and provision. We do that in Jesus' name. And I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you stand with me? And as we sing this last song, we're going to give full voice to the reality that the joy of the world has come. And this season, we celebrate intention, the longings that we have, and the fulfillment that's in Jesus Christ. And so I invite you now, with full voice, let's sing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. The
for rehearsing our joy together. As Wade mentioned, if you want to continue to stay in that um, space of practicing, of naming, confessing, working through that, our prayer team is in the corner and would love to minister to you, to walk um, through that with you. If you're not sure today where God is in your story, um, if you feel like you're deep in darkness, or if you're in the midst of uh, testing, whatever that looks like, um, we want to do that as a community together. We want to be in it with you. If you are experiencing grief, we do have a service coming up. Um, we had mentioned that this time of year can be difficult when we've experienced loss. The, even if the loss was years ago. Um, I had that this week too where the loss of my mother-in-law came up in unexpected ways. And even as we were planning for the blue Christmas service, which is happening on December 21st, I realized I needed to go there. I needed to um, be in that space of grief once again. So I invite you to come to that um, at 7 p.m. And then our Christmas Eve services on December 24th. We have some invitations. You are welcome to take a bunch and hand them out to your friends and your neighbors. But we're excited to come either 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. So uh, today, SPAC, I bless you with the gift of faith that allows you to hang on. May you be comforted in your misery. May your longings for the things of God be increased. For whatever your land of Moriah is, may you know God as the one who provides. And as you leave here, may you be agents of joy wherever you go. Go in peace.